lectionary passage for the day as we uh, prepare ourselves to participate and receive the Lord's communion uh, towards the end of our service. Uh, we, I think at the beginning of the service, we're able to hear another part of the lectionary passage, Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, and I think all of these uh, passages prayerfully present for us a, a powerful uh, declaration of uh, the, the kind of differences between um, the way God seems to structure the world and the way that we exist in the world. Uh, Arthur, the author of this passage, the Apostle Paul, uh, is uh, one of the most prolific writers and church planners in the New Testament, uh, the early church, and he is writing this letter to the church in Corinth, uh, a church that uh, was born uh, out of great diversity, out of uh, a lot of uh, uh, worship of many different uh, gods and, and traditions, and, and, and Paul is calling um, the, the church in Corinth uh, to a very powerful uh, kind of crossroads and moment, uh, I believe, of, of decision and, and, and of, of a realization uh, as it relates to the difference between uh, what the ways of God are and what the ways of the world uh, are. And uh, we'll spend uh, some time then in First uh, Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 18. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, read us through the New Revised Standard Version and uh, may revisit the, the message translation that is on the screen just for the purposes of us uh, maybe hearing this again in plain English. The word of the Lord uh, from the text declares, uh, verse number 18, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Verse 20 says, Where is the one who is wise, and where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age, and has not God made foolish the wisdom of of the world, for since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, for God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Verse 25 says, For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. So consider your own call, brothers and sisters, that not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing, things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God, for he is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, in order that it, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of God for all of us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. We're going to excuse the topic, the topic we've used before, amen, in this passage, simply wise fools and strong weaklings. Wise fools and strong weaklings. Father, in the name of Jesus, we say thank you. Thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for life and health and strength. We ask you, God, to bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we may not sin against you. And as I stand to preach and teach your word, I pray that you will send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy and it rests upon me and even the hearers of this word. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Go back and let us take a quick reread of this passage in some plain English. Uh, I love how... Uh, this passage makes very plain, I think, what sometimes may uh, come across a little uh, uh, hard to follow. Remember, just uh, let's read along and let's see how the text uh, really uh, kind of, uh, 
you know, makes clear the juxtaposition, if you will, of uh, the ways of God and the ways of this world. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. For this is the way God works, and most powerfully, as it turns out. It's written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as crackpots. So where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world and all of its fancy wisdom never had a clue. When it came to knowing God, God in his wisdom took delight in using what the world considered dumb preaching of all things to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. So while Jews claim clamor for miraculous demonstrations and Greeks go in for philosophical wisdom, we go on right, we go right on proclaiming Christ, the crucified. Jews treat this like an anti-miracle and Greeks pass it off as absurd. But to us who are personally called by God himself, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom all wrapped up in one. <coughs> Human wisdom is so tiny, so impotent, next to the seeming absurdity of God. Uh. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's weakness. So take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, no offense. Uh, not many influential, no offense. Not many from high society families. Again, no offense. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies? That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own, blowing your own horn before God. Everything, somebody say everything. Everything, everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean state, slate and a fresh start comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. Man, now I find, you know, the words of scripture very frequently to uh, say things and make claims that often, if taken seriously, are irrational to the uninitiated. Uh, certainly to many of us who uh, have been in church for a while. I think we lose the scandalous nature of the gospel, the claims that it seeks to make in our lives. But if we continue to take Jesus seriously and the scriptures seriously and what they are attempting to do and the work they are attempting to perform in our lives, I want to submit to you that the words of God when fully embraced, forced us to be uncomfortable. Uh, because how many of you know that no matter where you are in your life journey, when you get next to God, God still makes you feel uncomfortable. And it's not a bad discomfort, it's almost like a, you know, discomfort uh, that reminds you not only of what you maybe are lacking, but also uh, the truth of where you may or want or desire to be. Amen. That to be near and next to God and to take God seriously uh, lifts things that in our own humanity we often leave glazed over. We have a sense that there's some things that need adjusting, but we're not always very clear about what they are. So scripture and the words of Jesus, I think, always give to us some wonderful benchmarks uh, that I think, if we take seriously, uh, should make us want to sometimes wish the scripture would go away. Somebody say amen. amen. Or ouch. Or just say something. Amen. Uh, how, how, how many of you uh, uh, 
uh, have heard some of these declarations that Jesus has made. Uh, one said that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Man, for all of us who are striving to be first, amen, uh, you know, it, it seems to take a little bit of an edge off of your rush, at least off of my rush. If I'm trying to be first, and, and, and it turns out that when I get to be first, and I'm all going to be at the back of the line, it makes me question, what's the point of being first? Or maybe statements like, uh, Jesus told the wealthy person, give everything that you have to the poor, and come and follow me. And certainly... Some of us who claim to be poor or are poor, we feel like, well, I like that scripture because I get the best out of that deal. Amen. Amen. How many of you know that uh, if you live in the United States of America, amen, uh, you kind of more wealthy than, say, 90% of the rest of the world. Somebody say amen, right? Uh, or how about this, this declaration that Jesus makes? Uh, forgive those that offend you seven and then the part after that verse, he says, if you don't forgive them, then your heavenly father will not forgive you. That's a hard saying. Amen. I got to forgive somebody. Like one, not everybody all together. That may be a little more realistic, right? All I have to do is forgive like 490 times in my life. Cool. No. Seems like Jesus is saying, one person, the same person or that person that continuously gets on your nerves, that does you wrong, that puts you out of your element. It says that you have to forgive them over and over and over and over again. Or how about this last one uh, that I like to bring up from time to time, which probably was many of us the wrong way, that if uh, someone... Uh, physically assaults you. Someone hits you on your cheek that you are to turn the other cheek and let them hit the other side. Again, how many of you know that this is just not natural? This is not the way we are shaped and conditioned and socialized to be. That the ways of God are very irrational to many of us, even as we are following his ways. The truth be told, uh, many of us have lost the, the irrationality of the claims of God in our lives, and we have settled for the status quo, and dare I say, it contributes to why we remain unchanged. We just fit neatly inside the confines of a world and of a culture that in many ways is anti-God. Secular has no appreciation or desire to awaken us to something greater than ourselves. But how many know when you become a follower of the way? The life and the teachings of Jesus is what the way is. There are some things in our lives that must be upset. When you follow Jesus, there are certain ways of living that must be interrupted. That when you subscribe to salvation and receive the gift that has been given to us freely by our Savior, there are some loyalties that must be called into question. And that in many ways, the, the gospel in all its irrationality seeks to call into question the wisdom of this world. And make you and I have an appreciation that even with all of our wisdom and our privilege and our knowledge, that it is still far inferior to the wisdom, the strength, and the knowledge of God. And the whole of the rest of our lives then is about being in many ways deprogrammed to the ways of this world and programmed to the ways of God. can be very painful, frustrating. Uh, so I had someone tell me, you know, you know, the devil, uh, the devil I know is better than the one I don't know. Amen. I, mean, I, 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 I don't like all this drama, but you know, uh, I've kind of gotten used to it, and I, I, I don't like some of these challenges, but I, I've gotten used to it. But how many of you know that part of what it means when you follow the ways of God is that you may get an exchange between one way of struggle and another. Because you're going to struggle even as you follow the ways of God. But struggling following the 
ways of God still guarantees you a destination that gives you everything you will want. But struggling following the ways, your ways, gets you what you have already. Mm. As much as we are aware of where we want to be, how many of you know that God can give you awareness of where you will be? Amen. With lots of faith and with lots of confidence. Ways of Jesus then give you and I access to the ultimate power and the ultimate pathway into a life that is worth living. In this way, the text that Paul lifts up to us, it compares the wisdom of this world and the foolishness of God. And he shows the distinctions that work between human strength and divine wisdom. He makes the argument that only when you become comfortable living in the paradox of the gospel, the contradictions of progress, and the riskiness of even resurrection, can you experience the wisdom and the power of God. This is why he proclaimed in verse number 18 that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And I want you to appreciate today that part of what it means for us to be wise fools and, and to be strong weaklings is to make sure that the emphasis that we are placing on our wisdom is not the wisdom of this world, but it is the wisdom of God. But when you place an emphasis on the wisdom of God, how many of you know in this world they may call you a fool? When you are placing the emphasis not on the strength this world, but the strength of God, how many of you know in this world they may still call you weak? But if you're going to be a fool, if you're going to be weak, I'd rather be a fool for God and a weak person that has the strength of God inside of me. Now, give me a name, I'm to tell them I'd rather roll with God. Amen. I'd rather roll with God. Now, 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 everybody was interesting claims to have God on their side. Ain't that some? Amen. That folk who murder folk think that they hurt folk in the name of God. Folk who, who hurt other people claim that they're hurting folk in the name of God. Like, we all seem to be very quick to ascribe God as the rubber stamp for all of our stuff. But what does it look like to actually think and appreciate that there is a distinction between God's way and the world's way? Uh, that's the first thing that I'll lift up in this sermon today, that God's way and our way are not altogether the same. Everybody say that. God's ways are not our ways. Now, Isaiah says it like this, that, that God's thoughts are above our thoughts, and His ways are above our way. That we may even be in relationship with God, but we still have this kind of uh, Intense. 
meals, and you know, as children, you know, my dad, I think he made a mistake by saying, you know, six of us, you know, like, y'all get whatever you want, praise God. So I, being the very hungry one, you know, I ordered an appetizer, I ordered a main meal, and I ordered a, a dessert. And I was just eating that appetizer with some nachos. They brought out a big old thing of nachos. And I tore that nachos up. <laughs> they ordered a hamburger, that's what usually kids get, right? Big old thing of hamburger. And by the time I ate the nachos, I was so full. And I just stared at that hamburger. <laughs> and my dad stared at me. <laughs> I said, you better eat all. <laughs> senses will tell us that I can't live without this thing. But God's way says that in every state of your life, what does it mean to learn to be content? God's way says that you know, harboring resentment and, 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 and anger in your heart, it don't damage the person you upset with. It diminishes your own ability to be the person God has called you to be. All these principles are God's ways. But if we don't know God's ways, then the ways of the world will become our ways, and we will put God on top of our ways, not the ways of the world. And how many of you know just because you put God's stamp on it don't mean it's God's way? Because there's a way that seems right unto us, but the end is destruction. Somebody say God's way, God's way. or no way. The second thing I think the scripture lifts up to us as a very powerful example of what it means to be a wise fool and to be a strong weakling is found in verse number 25. It says that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. You and I must appreciate the rhetorical use of, of language in this particular passage uh, because in many ways to assume or to think that God has weaknesses or God
And you can be trying to argue, you know, God, I'm not, you know, you just, you know, and after a while, how many know God's word, God's intervention, God's truth may be foolish and weak to us, but it ain't at all foolish or weak. generation generation but the constant consistent presence is God's ways and I want you to be as a follower of Jesus as a seeker of God to appreciate there's a benefit in subscribing your life to the quote unquote foolishness of God to the weakness of God to resisting the urge to just chase after every new idea and new thought and new fad. I, you know, I, I, I said earlier in our service, uh, earlier today, that some of us need to appreciate that not every idea is has equal value. Our culture, very interestingly enough, you know, has all these competing Now, I was watching Grammys last week, and, and, and you know, uh, I, 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 I'm a music aficionado. Praise God. Like, I think I'm pretty cultured. But there's some messages and things that are coming through our culture today that are deeply unsettled. This idea that you can have everything, any way you want it, whenever you want it, is not reasonable. I was talking to someone the other day, and, you know, they were talking about how, you know, they believe that they should be able to have everything. I said, well, you're not created to have everything. Imagine if you woke up tomorrow and everything was in your living room. <laughs> Just imagine. Like, what would you do with everything? Many of us can't do much with what we have. <laughs> and it's a little bit of something. Somebody say amen, right? Yeah. Amen. Like, 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 we, we, <laughs> we act like, you know, the problem is we don't have enough. No, 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 that's really the problem. The problem is you don't know what to do with what you have. Mm -hmm. uh, I was listening to uh, one of the, the, the guys on, on Power 105, you know, on one of these hip-hop uh, radio station and, 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 and he, he was talking about how he wished that he could have more than one wife at a time. And then he went on and keep talking and he said, but you know what, I think about that, that may be hard because I really can't deal with the one I have right? <laughs> right, 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 right. That, that you know, uh, and sometimes our desire for excess, the desire for excess robs us of our ability to be good stewards over what we have right now. I was telling this person, I said, you know, um, uh, as a human being, you cannot have everything because you are not created to have everything. You cannot be everywhere. We as human beings are, are, are limited to wherever we are. I can't be here and there at the same time. I can't hold on, I only have two hands, praise God. Amen. So whatever I have in my hands is all I'm able to have. Now what does it mean for us to resist some of these messages that are easily being put upon us that make you and I feel like if it's not a certain way, if it's not a certain thing, don't look a certain way. If some of this stuff, is, 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 it calls a, a powerful critique against the ways of God, the child of God, I want you to always appreciate that in the mind of the world, this may make great sense. But it's foolishness. And it's weak. And God is inviting you and I in the, in the specificities of our lives to ask hard questions. Where in my life am I subscribing more to the strength of human ideas 
and the wisdom of human beings rather than the thoughts and the ways of God. There's no competition. Scripture says again, heaven and earth will pass away before one word of God falls to the ground. And if you take that seriously, if we take that seriously, then the wise thing is to build our lives on the words of God. Because the words ain't falling. Everything else is going to fall. But the words of God will not fall. And you know, that looks so much different in uh, many of our lives. As a parent, some of us have to trust that if we raise our children up in the way they should go, they will not depart. Now that may look like, good Lord, they all the way over there like the prodigal son. But how you know the prodigal son always comes home? <coughs> that means that sometimes in your life you may have a lot, you may have a little, but you know that God's going to take good care of So building your life on these truths stabilize us and cause us to not become shaken by all the transitions that life will bring. The final thing I'll lift up that I believe is indicative of wise fools and strong weaklings. It's found in verse 30 and it says that God is the source of your life. He became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Somebody holler, God is my source. God is my source. Say it again, God is my source. God is my source. Paul reminds us that the capacity to live out divine wisdom, the capacity to live out justice, right living, righteousness, the capacity to live out sanctification is not possible apart from a connection with God. And being connected to God gives us unlimited access to the sustainable power of God. When we are disconnected from God's wisdom, we become inundated with the wisdom of this world. And when the wisdom of this world becomes our sensibility, the ways of God lose their intelligibility in our lives. When we disconnect from the source of God and start plugging into other things, those other things begin to make more sense to us. And God begins to sound like a foreign language. Righteousness loses its appeal. Right living. Contentment. Generosity. Justice. They lose their appeal when they are disconnected from the source. I was deeply troubled by a some research I was doing for some work and, and it said that 85 individuals own 50% of the world's wealth. 85 folk. And I don't think any of them are here. <laughs> if you are here, probably means you're not tired, praise God. We would know. But <laughs> you want to make fight. Amen. 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 Uh, uh, now what does it mean for 85 folk to own 50% of the wealth of the world when God created a world that has enough for everybody? It means that somewhere, some, or in the course of someone's life, there was this disconnection from the source of all that is good and great. That part of what I want to submit is that you and I cannot be people who follow the ways of God and not give of ourselves the way God has given of God's self to us. When God blessed Abraham in the text, he said, I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing. He didn't say, I'm going to bless you so you can build yourself a great empire. So you can have you the most toys when you die. So you can have, he said, your name will be great so then you can amplify my name. And I want you as a follower of Jesus to appreciate that. You are so connected to this source that it gives you 
an unlimited possibility. This is, this is, this is I think, one of these kind of uh, 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 paradoxes, if you will, that you can't have everything, but through God, you can do anything. That when you are connected to the source that is God, <coughs> there's nothing that you can't do with the help of your God. And we, the source, we be connected to this source, positions you and I to not be overwhelmed by the falsities of this world, but to be clearly and acutely aware that God, I want, if I'm connected to you, to live out I want to search one of the Psalms passages says that I will search for the ways of God. And sometimes these ways may seem elusive to me. They may be like all the stuff I said earlier and what Jesus said, but just hearing it and investigating what does it mean? How I many are two different things? God, what does it mean for me to turn the other cheek? Because if you find out what it means, you may be in a better position to learn to do it. What does it mean to keep forgiving folk? Don't be able to do it. Because some folk, I just can't forget. But you may begin to learn and discipline yourself that the act of forgiveness will bless you more than the person you need to forgive. The ways of God is for the bill. Powerfully read in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, he laid out a whole number of them. And I'm just going to read them in close. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How is it that someone who is poor can have a kingdom? God, what does that mean? Blessed are they who, they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. That's not the wisdom of this world. Survival of the fittest, the strong survive, but the meek will inherit the earth. What does that mean? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Oh, help me today. That means if you make it more, then you kind of exit yourself out of being called a child of God. <laughs> Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For there is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people revile you, persecute, persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the source that we must be connected to. And this must become a part of who we are. It must be a natural, a natural uh, instinct of how we see the world and frame the world. I believe it is in this way that we become wise fools and we become strong weak. Some folks say, I, I ain't nobody's fool. You somebody's fool, you just don't know. <laughs> Somebody say amen. And the best way to tell is just look at pictures 10 years ago. <laughs> Some of us had hairstyles, we had glasses on, we had color, court, color, you know, uh, 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 Make you look foolish. And you anyone ever looked at your, the, your wedding pictures like, you know, well, our wedding pictures were in Barbara. <laughs> we did a real classic look, praise God, so, you know, it'll fit. You know, some of you know, I don't mean no hard, you know, fucking had no big old ties and ruffles everywhere. It's like, yeah, that was from the 70s, right? You know? <laughs> when I was in high school, I had the gummy cut, you know, you know, you know, like my head was, was, you know, always the optical illusion type deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> but God being my source is the ultimate ground. And I want to submit to you today that this is who we as people must be. You're a fool for something you just don't know, you just don't acknowledge it. If you're going to be a fool for anything, I say be a fool for God. Because 
even God's foolishness will be our wisdom. Let's stand to our feet as we prepare.